Well, last week we were talking about the passage we just read from John chapter 8, the woman caught in adultery. Unfortunately, that's a misleading title, isn't it? (laughs) Because there was a guy involved in that adultery as well, but the focus is upon her for whatever reason. Remember, those little subtitles, they're not divine, they're not uh, inspired, Uh, so... When you look at your Bible and it says, the woman caught in adultery above, and then you start reading, uh, that was put there by uninspired people. Uh, But uh, they want to point us to at least uh, what what the text is about. And it's about this woman who was caught in adultery, whereby there should also have been a man mentioned in the context as well. For there was, actually. But as we consider what the words of Jesus were when he says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me should not walk in darkness. That's in the subjunctive mood. That's why there's the word should. Unfortunately, there are translations that put shall or will uh, without ever giving a consideration that the subjunctive mood is a might or maybe. So, When he says, I am the light of the world, whoever or he who should walk in the light or should not walk in darkness. uh, He's saying those who might not walk in darkness, because there's always a possibility that someone will walk in darkness. That's why it's in a subjunctive mood. But in any event, the point that we were making last week was whether or not. It's in the subjunctive, and it is, but whether or not one sins, I want us to understand the meaning of what that sin is. It's not a one-time sin. In other words, he who follows me should not walk in darkness. Darkness is a euphemism, a metaphor for sin, for darkness, for everything associated with temptation and sin And especially the source of temptation and sin, the devil, Satan. So he's saying whoever continues, whoever should continue walking in darkness. That's the point. It's not whoever has sinned one time will be destroyed. That's not what he's talking about. Whoever has sin in their lives, that's not what he's talking about. Why? All of us have some kind of sin in our lives. All of us from time to time stumble, we fall, we fail. We hence miss the mark, right? Jesus is the light. He shows us that he's the target, that we are to be like him in every possible way. And yet we fall short of that mark. We miss the mark. Hence, we sin. But the point is on the continuation aspect. Should you continue walking in darkness? Not that you may have been in darkness, but that you should continue walking in darkness. Now he's talking about something totally different. He's now talking about a state or a condition of life that one has. That is... One does not take Jesus seriously. One does not take his word seriously. One does not take his church seriously. One does not take what we just completed seriously. That he died for our sins. And so Jesus goes on to tell us. He says, here I am. I've given you myself for your sins. But I've also got a new testament, a new covenant that goes along with this, a new covenant in my blood. And I want you to follow that. I want you to follow it the best you can. And I say the best you can because we can't do things perfectly. We might get it right one day and get it wrong the next. But he says, you still must walk in the light. That is the light of his truth and that's where life is in the truth as I mentioned before 
He is, he came full of grace and truth. And he said that to the apostles, he said, sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. Therefore, we have a connection between grace, light, and truth. To be in one, you have to be in the other. Right? To eliminate one and hold to another, we still find ourselves outside of Christ. The access to Jesus is always through the truth, his truth. That's why he says, uh, you shall know what? The truth. And what? And the truth will make you free. And that's not subjunctive. It, it doesn't say, and it might make you free. But he says, if you are in the truth, if you know the truth, it will make you free. And how do we know the truth? That's verse 32 of John chapter 8. He tells us in verse 31 of John chapter 8. He says, if you continue in my word, you are my disciples indeed. Or you are truly my disciples. Or we could say, you are my true disciples. Is what he's saying. If you do that, if you do what? If you continue in his word. What does that mean? Do I continue reading my Bible? Well, that's part of it. Really what he's talking about is the application of his word. If you continue living, continue living by my word. If you continue employing my teaching to your hearts and to your lives. Right? The Bible tells us in Jeremiah chapter 31 about the coming of the new Testament, the new covenant. And it says that I will write my laws in their heart. And David said, thy word have I, uh, have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. David had God's word written on his heart because he took it to heart. That's the point. And so he was walking in the light of God. That's what John was talking about in 1 John chapter 1. Not the gospel of John, but the book of 1 John chapter 1 verse 5. He said, this is the message we heard from him and declare unto you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie. And do not practice the truth. Practicing the truth. Walking in the light. Abiding or continuing in his word. Or following Jesus. Is about following his word. So they go together. And that is part and parcel of being in the light. And that's exactly why he says. Whoever follows me. Will never or should never walk in darkness. And of course, we have to understand now, if we're walking in the light, we know we're going to sin, right? Jesus tells us, the Holy Spirit tells us, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. What's he saying? Well, if we walk in the light, you're going to be perfect. Is that what he said? No. Well, if you walk in the light, you're going to be pretty much sinless. No, that's not what he said. The next verse is important. He says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So it's pretty clear, therefore, that if we're walking in the light, we're doing the best we can. But because we're human and we're not Jesus and we're not God, but because we're human, we make the wrong decisions and the wrong choices. And therefore we sin. But notice that is different than continuing to make the wrong choice or choices. That's a condition of the soul. That's a condition of the heart. That's what he's talking about when he's saying you cannot be in that condition. You cannot remain in sin. You cannot be in darkness on one hand. This is how they, they say straddling the fence. 
You can't, you can't be in Jesus Christ on one side of the fence and then live a life totally opposite of the life of Jesus on the other side of the fence. You can't do it. Jesus said it's, it's, it's either all or nothing. You either are with me or you are against me, right? You can't have it your way. You got to have it his way, like Burger King. You got to have it, well, that's your way, but you got to have it his way. So therein lies the difference concerning this idea of light. Now, going back to the story we were reading, we understand she's caught in the very act. We understand that she was with somebody else. We understand that there should have been the male there because that's what the law said needs to be done. So we understand that right off the bat, these fellows, these Pharisees, these Jews that brought this woman to Jesus were, one, they had neglected the law. They sinned against the law. They violated the law of Moses. Probably willingly. Because they brought only the woman. Knowing of the incident. So they willingly sinned against God this way. But they also sinned against God because they brought her to Jesus. Right? While Jesus is going around preaching, I'm the son of God. I'm God in the flesh. Uh, I can forgive sins. He wasn't the one to whom the Pharisees were to bring the guilty party or parties. They were to bring the guilty parties to the Sanhedrin, a group of 70 elders made up of the uh, Pharisees and the Sadducees, primarily the Sadducees, and they would oversee the ruling. They were the court of law. They were the Supreme Court. So they would bring the guilty to them and they would hear the case and they would decide upon the guilt and or the innocence of the parties. But they didn't do that. They brought her to Jesus. So there's strike two. And strike three is they did not care about the truth, nor did they care about the soul of that, that woman, nor did they care about the soul of the man who was also guilty. And nor did they care about whether Jesus would give them a proper answer or not. And Jesus, knowing all this, stoops down, he starts writing. And again, we don't know what he wrote. There's too much speculation about it, but he wrote something. And then he stood up and he says, You who are without sin, cast the first stone. And, uh, and it says, one by one, from the oldest to the youngest, they dropped their rocks, walked away. That tells us something. They were trying to trap Jesus, but the answer that Jesus gave kind of just weaved itself from one extreme to the other. And they were not expecting that answer. And here he is, he gives that direct answer. And they could not catch him in anything. They could not accuse him of being wrong in any manner. And that gets us back to neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Then Jesus spoke to them again saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. In connection with he who follows me should not walk in darkness. Remember in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 24 thereabouts, Jesus says, all who desire to come after me, let him, what? Deny himself, pick up his cross. And Luke's account, it says, pick up his cross daily, right? And follow me. So if you want to know the definition of following Jesus, then we have to understand the definition that Jesus gave to following. That is, denying ourselves and picking up our crosses daily and following him. That's what's involved in following. And too many people, they want to give lip service to Jesus. I love Jesus. He's graceful. He's, and I just want to be him. And the picture of heaven and, and Jesus holding the little lamb and stroking it and petting it. And we love those things. But Jesus said that he 
is full of what? Grace and truth. And he says you need to know the truth. Because why? It's going to make you free. But didn't you die for us? Didn't your, sin, didn't your blood cleanse us from our sins already? Jesus is telling us what we need to do in association with the cross. He's saying, look what I did. I gave up my life for you. Now you give up your life for me. And we give up our lives for him when we deny ourselves. You know, Jesus, when you think about the idea of Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he was asking the Father, basically, do I really have to go through with this? I don't really want to hang on a cross. I know I have to. I don't really want to. He denied himself. Now think about that the next time you're confronted with temptation. All right? That's the idea of denying yourself. To the point that you're going to say, okay, I'm not going to do it. But I'm really not going to do it because I'm going to hurt myself. That is, I'm going to crucify myself to doing, for not doing that. Right? I'm going to pick up my cross daily. I'm going to crucify myself. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to say no to these things as much as I want to. I'm not going to do it. But this gets back to the other idea we spoke about from the beginning. And John says, I write these things unto you, little children, that you might not sin. So there it is. Here's the idea. I write these things. Here's what you need to do. God expects you not to sin. But that's not the end of the chapter. Nor is it the end of the book. Because he goes on to say, but if any man does sin, let him know we have an advocate, Jesus Christ, the righteous. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So the point here is that if we're going to deny ourselves, and even if we pick up our cross, and in the heat of the moment, and or in the blink of an eye, we decide that we're going to not deny ourselves, he still says there's hope for you. He still says there's a remedy for you. He still says his blood, and this gets back to another aspect. His blood continues to cover our sins when we are walking in the light. So again, we're right back to the whole crux of the matter. If we walk in the light, we're in Christ Jesus. We're doing the very best we can. But along the way, we face temptation. And that doesn't mean we're not going to fall to temptation. It means that we will fall to temptation. Because he says, if we say we have no sin, well, the moment I say I have sin, guess what? I have failed. I have fallen to the temptation. But he says, That's, you're still my child because that mistake, that sin does not make you who you are. You are not defined by sin as a child of God. You are defined by the blood of Jesus Christ being a child of God. That makes all the difference in the world. Those outside of Jesus are defined by who they are. Sin. And unfortunately, the Bible tells us they are in darkness because they are not light in the Lord. Because that's what Paul was getting at in Ephesians chapter 5. He says, for you were all once in darkness, but now light in the Lord. So if you are light in the Lord, what did he say? So walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. That's our first downfall right there. We understand the unfruitful works of darkness. Sin. Right? That's the metaphor for things that come from Satan. Temptation and evil and sin. We're enticed by those things. And then he says, have no fellowship with those things. So you do your best to get rid of those things. But on the other hand, 
But if any man sins, let him know he have an advocate with, with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So that's the grace being contemplated here when Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Because what has he done? Remember, we're talking about light. Light is not only the metaphor for truth and goodness and righteousness. It's also an illumination of truth. It provides us the correct answers that gives us the correct way. Okay? So he says, you can know whether you are in darkness or whether you are in light. He says you need to examine yourselves to see if you're in the faith. And so the idea is, is that if we do fall, there's the remedy. Number one, Jesus Christ, the blood. But the blood is not activated if we're in Jesus Christ until what? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There it is. And so many people find that so difficult to understand. Jesus simply says, okay, you're in Christ Jesus. You've put me on in baptism. You've clothed yourself with me. You've come up out of the waters, a new creation in Christ Jesus. And if you sin, you still have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ the righteous. And so he says, you're forgiven. Your sins will be forgiven, but it's conditioned. Right? Because he says, if we confess our sins, if we do that, then he says, then I will forgive you. I will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So therefore, we find that salvation is always conditioned upon doing the will of the Father, doing the truth, practicing the truth. This is not part of our lesson, uh, part of the scriptures on the PowerPoint, but if you would, turn to the book of John, the Gospel of John, chapter 3. John, chapter 3. He says in verse 21, but he who does the truth, does the truth, that is he who does the word, he who practices the truth, he who obeys, quite simply, that's what he's saying, he who obeys the truth comes to the light that this or that his works, deeds, may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. So the whole point is that we find in John chapter 3 and verse 16, we know it well, the golden text of the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whoever shall believe in him should not perish. Notice, subjunctive, should not, might not perish. Some translations like to say, whoever believes in God will never perish, but have everlasting life. That's not what it says. Should not perish, but have everlasting life. There is the big, a big theological difference between what God actually says in the text with what man teaches. Big disparity. But as he says, whoever believes in him, well, here we get the idea of the definition of believing in Christ. In verse 21. But he who does the truth, because he's the one believing in him. He who does the truth comes to the light that his works may be uh, clearly seen that they have been done in God. That's where the good works are. That's where the works of God are. God has given us works to do, things to do, commands to obey. All right. We're to love our neighbor as ourselves, right? Well, that's a command. We're to do those things. We're to show kindness, love, respect. And then we can think about those moral attributes being added to that. Having patience, kindness, love, faith. All those moral attributes, whether for ourselves or towards others. So we treat people the way Jesus treated people. 
And then we have other commands associated with a worship service. Right? We're supposed to sing. Right? So we sing. We're supposed to pray. So we pray. We're supposed to take the Lord's Supper every Lord's Day, every first day of the week. And so we do that. To do what he said. And so those are works that are clearly seen that have been done where? In God. In God. That's walking in the light. Because the light has illuminated us with what we are to do. We are to do those, those things necessary uh, in pleasing our Lord. In fact, Romans chapter 2 beginning of verse 4 on down to verse 11 tells us that we should be looking to please him. We should be looking for glory, honor, and immortality. Well, that tells me something there too. Immortality means life everlasting. Right? Right now we're mortal beings. We have a we have a definite end date sometime. Hopefully it's somewhere way, way out there. But we don't know. It could be now. But whatever it is, we're mortal. He says, but you seek for goodness, honor, glory, and immortality. That is for eternal life in Christ Jesus. Well, he's the only one that can give eternal life to you and me. But it's conditioned upon walking in the light, which gives us subconditions, which is things we must do and obey. That's why it's condition. Uh, that's why salvation is conditional. That's why there's an if there. If we walk in the light, if we confess our sins, those things are very important. One of these days, I'm going to go through the New Testament and do a series of lef lessons on that one little word, if. It's a little word, but it's a great, big, powerful word, too. You need to know the word, if. So as we consider this idea of light and darkness, Jesus said, I have come as a light into the world that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. And if anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge. But he who rejects me has one who judges him. The word that I have spoken, the same will judge you in the last day. Therefore, we find the significance of knowing his word, not just knowing it mentally, memorizing it. We can do that a lot. And that's why we sin, because we know what it says. We know what he wants us to do, but we don't do it or we fall short of doing it. And, uh, and so he says, we're going to be judged by that. And what the world doesn't understand is that they're too going to be judged by God's word. Did you leave, live up to the standard? Not perfectly, but did you live up to the standard in faith to, to the standard that I have given you? We're all going to be judged. Remember in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10, will all appear before the judgment seat of Christ for all the things that we've done in the body, whether good or bad. So there is a judgment day, but the idea is if we walk in the light, we can know that we're, and be assured of our salvation, never have to worry about it. A lot of people fear death because when they die, they're not going to be sure of where they're going. But Jesus came to say, listen, you don't have to fear death. Just continue walking in the light. Have faith in me. Know that I'm full of grace and truth. And so when we even don't practice the truth, we still have grace. That's the blessing of being in Christ Jesus. I can't stress how important that is to you and to me. Because a lot of people don't see it that way. Jesus still says, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. And a lot of people look at that verse and they, and they strain at it and then they go, well, my pastor tells me that's not true. All I really have to do is believe in Jesus. I don't have to be baptized. Baptism doesn't save you. For all sons of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For, because... Here's the reason why he says, for you're all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. B, 
Because for as many of you who have been baptized into Christ have what? Put on Christ. Literally, you have clothed yourselves with Christ. That's the idea. And Peter says, repent, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Be baptized. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for purpose, for the remission of your sins. Jesus says, he that believes and is baptized, purpose, shall be saved. For you all sons of God in faith. How? What was the purpose behind it? For as many been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Repent and be baptized every one in the name of Jesus Christ for the purpose, the remission of your sins. And of course, we find that in Acts chapter 22, the apostle Paul gives a recounting of his salvation process. How he came to be saved. Of course, we know that he was on the road to Damascus and Jesus spoke to him, the voice from heaven, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And then he tells Saul to go into the city whereby he will come into contact with a man named Ananias. Ananias would tell him the things that he needs to do. And then the Bible, as if anticipating this idea, said that Paul prayed and fasted for three days. Paul prayed and fasted for three days. And when the appropriate time came, Ananias comes to Saul, Paul, and he says, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized, washing away your sins. Calling on the name of the Lord. We need to understand the water itself doesn't wash away the sins. It's the act of faith in being baptized in water that washes away the sins. It's that act in faith that brings us to the blood of Jesus Christ that does cleanse us from all sin. That's the significant relationship between doing what Jesus said... And the result of having done what Jesus said. Forgiveness of sins. And so the idea of walking in the light is paramount. But it's based upon obeying the Lord. Doing the truth. Practicing the truth. And part of the truth of being in Christ is to be baptized just as Jesus said. Now who is going to deny the words of the Lord? Are you going to say, well, my pastor says he that believes is saved and then can be baptized just to be a part of the church? Or are you actually going to read the words of Jesus and accept what Jesus says? Which, by the way, is he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Which one's correct? He that believes is saved shall be baptized. Or he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. I think the words of Jesus are to be taken at their literal value. And of course, Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21, he said, baptism does also now save us. That is, doing the act that Jesus asked us to do in faith is that which puts us in Christ Jesus. If you haven't done that, you're not in the light. You're not in the light of Jesus Christ because you're not in the light of his word, which tells us how to be in the light of Jesus Christ. But Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so Jesus gives us the truth to follow. And if you desire to put Jesus Christ on this morning in baptism, where you find the forgiveness of your sins, and not only that, the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 2, that when those who believed and were baptized were added to the church that day by the Lord. By the Lord. They didn't join the church. The Lord added them to the church. If you desire that today, you can have that. Perhaps you've done that already. But you have not yet been faithful. Perhaps you've wandered away. The Bible tells us about 
this wide gate and this broad way that leads to destruction. And then he says, and many will follow therein. Many are going to take that broad gate and that broad way. But then he says, but narrow is the way. Narrow is the gate and difficult is the way that leads to eternal life. There it is. Sometimes we fall to the, the difficulty of it all and we give up and hence we sin. But there's still that remedy that Jesus says, confess your sins, things will be all right. If that's you this morning, then why don't you come forward now as together we stand and sing.